Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. It's Jinzo here. Today we will talk about the brief history of Steam. So sit back, relax, and let us begin. When one considers PC gaming, usually a certain list of features are mentioned in favor of the platform. Those might be, but not limited to, more competitive pricing for games, free online multiplayer, higher graphical fidelity. And the availability of extensive modding. However, these features were not always as developed. Undeniably, one of the biggest participants in making what PC gaming is today is the Steam platform. In its early infancy, PC gaming was extremely different. Game distribution was physical, with games requiring the game CD to be inserted at all times. And many titles had several CDs that had to be switched around at different points in the game. Digital games were non-existent, and players had to connect through dial-up to private computer servers called BBS or bulletin board systems, which allowed them to play online, watch news, and download patches or mods. Games that supported online multiplayer, like Quake, were released. However, finding a server was not easy. Since an IP address was required, which were only shared among players in person or posted by them on websites, a modding community was formed from this game as well. But there was no platform in place for ease of distribution of these creations. To resolve this, in 1996, Mark Surface created Planet Quake, a hosting and news site dedicated to the game. And later on, with a team of three developers, created Quake Spy, a service that allowed players to browse servers in real time. This platform was later on licensed to other game developers under the name Game Spy, as well as launching dedicated websites for gaming news and information called the Planet Network. This service was not the only one in existence at the time. The same year saw the launch of Battle.net by Blizzard, which was released with the groundbreaking Diablo 1, making it the first online service that was incorporated into a game fully. With the unveiling of another influential game by Blizzard in 1998, StarCraft, more features were added, such as ladder rankings and game filters. These services filled a necessary gap. However, with dial-up internet becoming superseded as broadband began its replacement in the early 2000s, there was a need for a platform that provided all these features in the same place. As most of us know, Valve is the company behind Steam. Previously, Valve had already created hit titles such as Half-Life and Counter-Strike, but these games and their online services. Were not easy to patch without a dedicated platform in place, causing many users to disconnect frequently. This, in combination with an increase in piracy and cheating, and realizing that 75% of their players used high-speed internet, Valve tried to think of an alternative distribution system. At first, they sought help in creating this service and approached other well-known companies. Valve's executive Doug Lombardi stated on the matter, "You know, we went around to Yahoo, Microsoft, and anybody who seemed like a likely candidate to build something like Steam. We went and asked, 'Are you guys doing anything like this?' And the response was, 'That's a million miles in the future. We can't help you.' With no partner in sight, but clear on their goal." Valve began creating Steam on their own in 2002, under the names Grid and Gazelle. They unveiled this platform in March of 2002 in the Game Developers Conference, and even released the beta on the same day in which 80,000 to 300,000 players had access to the service. The highlight release of the beta was Day of Defeat, a modification of Half-Life. To promote such titles, Gabe Newell, the CEO of Valve, announced he would offer mod teams a game engine license and distribution on Steam for nine hundred and ninety-five dollars. 
it would not be until September 11th of 2003 that Steam would be fully released, making its use mandatory in order to play the popular game Counter-Strike 1.6. This was a great strategy to increase the exposure of the service, but Valve did not foresee the thousands of players that would be looking to play the game on day one, so the official launch of Steam was complicated to some degree due to Valve's servers not being able to manage such a large player base. Despite this, Valve did not waver. They realized Steam's potential and began to push beyond its original scope. At first, Steam's purpose was to simply streamline the game patching process, making it optional for all other titles, not just in-house Valve developments. For example, in 2004, the World Opponent Network an online gaming service created by Sarah Games was shut down and replaced by Steam, making the new platform a requirement for all online features of games that were previously supported by that network, such as Homeworld, Outpost 2, and Soldier of Fortune. 2004 was also the year in which Half-Life 2 was released, the sequel to the critically acclaimed Half-Life. Valve used this opportunity to promote Steam, so they made the installation of the platform a requirement, even for retail copies of the game. Without an active online multiplayer feature like Counter-Strike, users feared a repetition of the same event that occurred on the platform's launch, as many felt it was unnecessary. And indeed, their fears were confirmed when a portion of the fanbase faced multiple issues when attempting to play Half-Life 2 due to Steam issues. Fortunately, this did not prevent the game from being a huge success, selling over 12 million copies in total, winning 39 Game of the Year awards and subsequently Game of the Decade, skyrocketing the popularity of Steam significantly in the process. With this, the platform began taking off. Valve knew they could do so much more Steam was only used for their own games up to that point, but in 2005, they added the first two non-Valve games of many to come. A real-time strategy game by the name Darwinia and a quirky fighting game called Ragdoll Kung Fu. These opened the possibility for other games to be featured on the platform, and Steam helped promote them with regular discounts and special offers which is now a staple of the platform. This success led to huge publishers like ID Software, IDOS Interactive and Capcom to start selling their games on Steam in 2007. On May of that year, 150 games were already on sale and 13 million accounts were created. With hundreds of games flooding Steam's market, Valve saw an opportunity to make the Steam experience more integrated and unique for their users, and in 2008 implemented an application programming interface, or API for short, called Steamworks, which allowed developers to integrate some of Steam's features, such as matchmaking and achievements, into their games, making the platform the staple choice for PC developers to feature their games on. With the popularity of the service rising, Valve hoped to accommodate this especially regarding the modding community. Modders motivated by their passion of games would create new content for titles they loved, and players could add these mods seamlessly to their favorite games with a click of a button. Valve was known to be an advocate of mods, considering that one of their most known games, Counter-Strike, was originally a mod of Half-Life, which was developed by two passionate players, Mun Lei and Jess Cliff. Because of this, Steam was the perfect platform for modders to be recognized, and in order to achieve this, Valve implemented the Steam Workshop in 2011, a tool for modders to post their content on the platform and for users to vote, download, and install these mods at their leisure. But Valve did not stop there. In order to further promote creativity and the recognition of skilled individuals, two new projects were launched in 2012, 
STEAM for Schools and STEAM Greenlight. STEAM for Schools' goal was to raise interest in game development at a young age. To do this, Valve released a free of charge package that included a modified version of Steam's client, the hit adventure puzzle game Portal 2, and a program called Puzzle Maker. This allowed students and teachers to create and edit levels at will. This package also provided an interface similar to Steam Workshop that allowed teachers to share and distribute the content created by students. On the other hand, Steam Greenlight was created to allow a platform for unrecognized but talented creators. With this service, developers could showcase their project ideas along with screenshots, videos, and early builds of their game. Then, Steam users could vote into projects that seemed most promising. Upon reaching a required number of votes, Valve would contact the project's creator to help them bring it to life. The Green Light initiative saw moderate success, approving 145 games. However, many users complained due to the lack of transparency, as well as developers being required to persuade players to vote for their projects. With this, Steam decided to replace Greenlight with Steam Direct, a simpler and streamlined system for Valve to moderate submitted content. At this point, Steam was already a well-known service for gamers, but PC gaming still had fundamental challenges to overcome if it wanted to become a home console. To breach into the living room space, in 2013, Steam released the first of many projects with this goal in mind, Steam's Big Picture. This allowed players to change from the usual Steam interface, with small font, mouse and keyboard controls, to a clearer display that could be controlled with a gamepad meant to be used on a TV that is further away from the player. Valve also created the in-house streaming service in 2014, which allowed players to stream their computer's gameplay to other devices connected to an external display. Valve even went as far as creating their own Linux-based operating system called the SteamOS, which, when implemented on a device, also supported in-home streaming. Keeping their open mentality of allowing users to create their own content, they announced this operating system would be free of charge and completely open source. Upon the reveal of this project in September 2014, Valve stated they had come to the conclusion that the environment best suited to delivering value to customers is an operating system built around Steam itself. They firmly committed to this idea and to support it in November 2015, two new undertakings were released. But this time, it would not be just new software. It was time for the Steam brand to venture into the hardware market. The Steam machine, a console-like pre-built computer that ran their own Steam OS, was meant to be used by players by connecting it to their TV. Different companies, such as Alienware, made their own version with varying specs, which allowed users to acquire a Steam machine with their desired specs and budget in mind. One of these machines, created by Valve, is called Steam Link. It is a small and budget device with the main purpose of only making use of the in-home streaming service and stream content from a computer in a different part of the house to the TV. With these ventures, Valve faced an important issue. Even though the Steam machines could take the PC gaming experience to the living room, a lot of games were not optimized to be used with a controller, and others such as real-time strategy games would be almost impossible to play without a mouse and keyboard. These peripherals were not designed to be played from a player's couch. To tackle this, Valve designed their own solution, the Steam Controller. 
This controller had similar features shared across its competitors, but two main features were added in order to allow players to enjoy games in their living rooms. To get around games that did not support a gamepad, controller mapping was implemented, which allowed users to rebind any mouse movement or key press to the desired controller input. Users could create and share specific game profiles with the Steam community so that players did not have to manually create a profile for each game individually. The solution to the second issue was implemented on the controller itself, where other controllers would place a directional pad or a second analog. The Steam controller features two trackpads which could be calibrated for several functions like mimicking mouse movements, even allowing one trackpad to make large and sudden movements and the second slow and precise ones. These projects were well motivated by intent. Despite this, the Steam controller was not a success. In addition, Steam machines sold far below expectation. Six months after launch, it had sold less than 500,000 units. As a comparison, the Xbox One and PlayStation 4 sold more than 1 million units each within just 24 hours of launch. This caused the project to be discontinued. Even the production of the smaller and cheaper alternative, the Steam Link devices, was interrupted. Valve was not able to reach their goals with their first hardware venture, but this did not prevent them from trying again. In 2016, with the popularity of VR games on the rise, they joined forces with electronics company HTC to create the HTC Vive, a virtual reality headset which allowed players to experience games in immersive 3D environments. This headset came with their own Vive controllers that provided a varied amount of input methods to accommodate different games and track the arm movements of the player. One main feature that differentiated HTC Vive from its competitors was the use of Vive base stations. These created a 360 degree virtual space in the real world so that players could walk around digital environments for a new level of immersion. The device saw reasonable success reporting on November of 2016 that more than 140,000 units were sold. In the same year, Steam VR was also launched. Like Big Picture, this was a different interface to the regular desktop version and allowed players to easily access their Steam library while using a VR headset. This mode was even compatible with other headsets such as the Oculus Rift. As we know, however, VR is still in its infancy and the games are often considered to be more of an immersive experience rather than what would be considered traditional gaming. As one would expect, the competition in the VR space will continue for years to come. As of 2019, Steam provides service to over a billion registered accounts and 90 million monthly active users. The Steam brand has become more than just an online video game retailer. By pioneering the distribution of digital games for the PC, it has created a community that allows players to freely develop content and be noticed on their merits rather than marketing success alone, giving rise to the spectacular indie game development scene as we know and love today. But the story does not end there, as we know there are many other distribution systems available that now compete with Steam, such as the Epic Store, Origin and even Discord. Who will emerge victorious? Only time will tell. And with that, we draw the curtain to a close. Thank you for being here with us. I'm Jinzo, and until next time, goodbye and good night.